Okay. Hi, everybody. Today, I have a guest on the channel, the Treat Dizziness at Home channel. Today, I welcome Dr. Lillian White, who is the owner of Empowered Health, and it is in Rocky River, Ohio. She is a board-certified family medicine practitioner and also has an extra certification in functional medicine. So she kind of uh, bridges that gap and blends that typical Western medicine with a more holistic treatment approach. So in today's topic, um, I can't think of a better person to speak of on this is dizziness from autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So uh, Dr. White, can you just take a moment to introduce yourself and your background? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Amy. I'm so happy to chat with you today. This is fun. Um, so yeah, so I, like you said, family doc um, with additional training in functional medicine. Um, I've always been pretty interested in more holistic health. Um, so very excited to be able to kind of combine the best of both worlds. I think sometimes medicine um, is great and we do need drugs, but sometimes people also want more alternative approaches or options. So it's kind of nice to be able to have both or one or the other as people are interested. Perfect. So Today's topic, I don't have a lot of this covered on my channel, so I'm really, really excited to talk to you, um, but can you explain what the autonomic nervous system is what and what its function is? Sure. Yeah. Um, so a few different ways to think about the autonomic nervous system. Um, I think it's helpful to kind of go back to maybe you remember middle school or high school biology class where they talked about rest and digest um, and fight and flight. So those are a couple of kind of pieces of our nervous system. So you've got the sympathetic nervous system, which is that fight or flight or kind of um, more activated state. Um, Cause sometimes it can be good, right? When we're playing basketball or whatever, we do need that heart rate to go up. So it's not always a bad thing. So our sympathetic nervous system. Um, and then we also think of our parasympathetic nervous system or kind of that more rest and digest um, piece, mm -hmm. um, which is very important as well. Um, more recently, we've also been talking about polyvagal theory, which we did some fun talks on, and that's kind of adds that additional layer of that free state, which sometimes people can get into when they're um, super stressed. You may have heard of animals playing dead. They're kind of freezing, um, mm -hmm. and that can happen sometimes with our bodies as well. So all pieces of this nervous system that come together to help us kind of be dynamic and um, interact with our, our daily life. Okay, so then... This autonomia uh, refers to a group of disorders where the autonomic nervous system is is dysfunctional and, and not quite working properly. So what symptoms do people experience when they may have an autonomic nervous system disorder? Yeah, no, good question. Um, so it can be very wide and very varied. <laughs> our nervous system um, actually interacts with every organ system in our body. So symptoms can be very wide ranging. Um, for some people, maybe more common symptoms with um, maybe their heart may be racing a little bit more. They may feel more lightheaded or dizzy when they stand more easily than others. Um, some people may feel a little bit of bloating or discomfort after meals if their um, uh, digestive tract isn't um, functioning from a nervous system perspective very well. Um, so just a few symptoms, but really it's pretty wide ranging. Okay. So... Can you start to get into the details of some of those conditions? So let's put some labels on the conditions that are considered dysautonomic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so one that comes to mind, we talk about probably not infrequently in my office is called POTS. Um, so you may have heard that word thrown around here and there, and it stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. So POTS for short, because that's a very long name. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that's a syndrome where people, um, again, kind of stand up and, and may feel their heart beating a little more quickly. Um, for some people, by definition, their blood pressure should remain the same. If their blood pressure also goes down. That is a sign of maybe something else is going on. Um, but that's kind of more common with, with POTS is that heart rate going up a little more quickly. Okay. Um, yeah, there are others too. I don't know how much detail yeah, you want to. Let's list others because I do have a lot of mm -hmm. uh, clients that that say, you know, my heart rate doesn't go up, my blood pressure drops. So what is that? Yeah, so that you think of orthostatic hypotension. So that's where the blood pressure goes down, but the heart rate isn't changing too much. Mm -hmm. 
And then clinically, what is that significant number that if somebody sees their blood pressure drop by what they should be concerned? Yeah, um, so you can look at systolic or diastolic blood pressure. Usually I'm looking more at systolic, but it's about 20 points. So if the blood pressure drops at least 20 points between laying down and standing up um, over a period of like 10 minutes or so, um, that's usually kind of the guideline. Over um, 10 minutes. So it doesn't have to be immediate. Right, you, right. You're wanting to look at that over 10 minutes. So I've had, I had a client who um, they would get up off the couch and they would be fine. And then about two to three minutes, you know, they would start to feel like, whoa. And, you know, it took me a minute to then test them two to three minutes later or walking around taking their blood pressure. And this is the interesting part. I did refer back to the physician and saying there's a drastic drop in blood pressure, like 120, you know, mm -hmm. over 80, and it drops to 88 over 60. Mm -hmm. But they did a tilt table test yeah. and they said she's fine. Oh, wow. So what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> what does yeah. somebody do? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's that's a really good point, right? Um, I think it goes back to the idea, especially like being a more holistic doc. Um, all of these diagnostic labels are, are just kind of that, right? We make them up. <laughs> they're labels we use to kind of be able to talk with one another and they're used for medication guidelines and insurance guidelines. But really at the end of the day, you're treating the person in front of you. And I think if the suspicion is still there and maybe the testing is it quite borderline or it's not quite supportive, I would still um, offer that person kind of more supportive care or other treatment options that may be helpful for them. Um, and sort of treat it sort of similar to how somebody with orthostatic hypotension would be treated. Yeah. Which is what I did. And I just, you know, recommended maybe a, a different provider, maybe one who is more mm, uh, able to look at a person holistically and listen to them and say, oh my, you have symptoms. I'm sorry it didn't fit into this box, right. but you are having <laughs> symptoms. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's why we need providers like you. Uh, <laughs> So are there any other conditions? So we have POTS that might be um, a disorder, orthostatic hypotension. Are there any other conditions that affect that autonomic nervous system that might give you symptoms? Yeah, yeah. Um, another one that I see come up a decent amount is um, like intestinal mobility. So gastroparesis, for example. So that's when someone's stomach isn't emptying at the normal rate we would expect it to. So typically for, for a healthy individual, it should, um, those contents, we eat food, it goes down to our stomach and it should pass through within about two to three hours or so. Um, but for some folks, if they do have gastroparesis or slowed um, emptying of the stomach, um, it can be even longer and that can cause some symptoms like bloating or discomfort um, after people eat, decrease appetite. Okay, and does that, for, does that give you dizziness as well or more just the gastrointestinal? Yeah, that's a great question. It can. Um, so I usually think of more gastrointestinal stuff, but um, there is a lot of overlap between all of these things. So once somebody's nervous system is affected in one area, it's certainly possible to have it affected in another. Okay. It's all kind of connected. <laughs> okay. um, what about like Earl's Danilus uh, mm -hmm. syndrome? Is that one that is considered under that uh, dysautonomia umbrella? Yeah. It does have some overlap. So not everybody with um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or hypermobility spectrum disorders has dizziness or has dysautonomia, but a lot of them do. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. So actually the guidelines say if somebody does have a diagnosis of hypermobility spectrum disorder or hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, EDS for short, um, it's recommended to evaluate them and make sure they don't have some signs of dysautonomia going on. Okay. Can you pull out any key differences that you can help our uh, viewers say, you know, look for this for orthostatic, look for this for ED, look for this for POTS, mm -hmm. and then take that to your doctor, of course, but maybe <laughs> suspect it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm obviously not treating or testing anyone here today, but yeah, I love to give people questions or things they can ask their doc. Um, so in terms of looking at POTS, so that may be somebody's describing, oh, my heart rate goes up when I stand really easily, or I'm standing in line at the grocery store. Maybe they've been staying there for a few minutes and then they start to notice their heart beating more quickly. So palpitations or heart beating more quickly when people are standing up can be something to, to let their doc know about for sure. Um, other signs maybe um, with more of the hypermobility disorders would be 
uh, my joints really hurt. <laughs> my joints are my joints are tender or painful. Um, or if somebody a common question I'll ask folks is um, if they they were one of those people in gymnastics class growing up that were super flexible or double jointed. Um, that can be a sign potentially of hypermobility spectrum disorder or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, if someone's skin is really um, super stretchy <laughs> more than maybe others, that could be a sign. Um, and then in terms of gastroparesis, again, just kind of healing full more quickly. They eat a few bites of food and, and they're full very quickly. That's a good thing to let their doc know about. Okay. So let's talk about, um, you know, as a physician, what tests or what, you know, what tests or diagnostics may you be looking at to help confirm that somebody has a, a you know, dysautonomic uh, mm. disorder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of these can be done in the office, which is great, okay. um, especially in, in your family doc office, depending on the knowledge of the physician. Um, so in terms of kind of going down the line with like POTS, um, so I'll do orthostatic vital signs to look for kind of both POTS and orthostatic hypotension or lower blood pressure. Um, so that's basically having someone lay down, um, checking their blood pressure and heart rate, and then having them stand up um, and waiting a period of like 10 minutes or so and rechecking their blood pressure and heart rates and comparing the two. Um, and there's different cutoffs for adults and children to be aware of, but that can be helpful for screening and, and seeing where people are at. Um, and then in terms of looking at more hypermobility spectrum disorders, so if someone does, has pot, does have POTS since there is so much overlap, I'll ask about are you double jointed and go through um, a formalized bite and scale. So that looks at how flexible somebody is based on different joints. Um, that's very easy to do in the office, takes like two minutes. Um, and there's a really nice kind of questionnaire um, that the, the Zebra Society, so they're the, the kind of special society for, um, medical society for um, patients with um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have put together a really nice um, medical office questionnaire that you can really just okay. go through with your doc and kind of check things off to, to help with um, diagnosing that. Okay, perfect. All right. So say we do our, our tests. Are there anything else that you're referring out to? Mm -hmm. if you yeah, absolutely. Or anything you're referring, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if somebody were um, feeling more like vertigo symptoms, or I was like, oh, I wonder if this is more vestibular when they're standing up and feeling dizzy, um, I may refer to vestibular therapy. So your group is really wonderful for that. Um, if somebody is um, just really having a hard time getting going. So for some people, the symptoms of POTS or orthostatic hypotension can be really debilitating. They're like, I can't get out of bed very much or really impacting my daily life, I may refer to um, physical therapy um, for getting people kind of slowly rehabilitated. Um, one of the main uh, treatments is actually a graded exercise program for patients with POTS. That's actually the main treatment that's recommended. Um, so that's something that I would definitely consider referring to if people are, are really needing some extra support. Okay. Are there any um, medication options that people should be aware of? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's kind of more conventional and then kind of more functional stuff, um, functional options. So in terms of kind of more conventional options, um, if somebody's heart rate is the main issue going up too high, um, medications like propranolol or beta blockers can be helpful for that. Um, there are some side effects to be aware of for, the, for some people. So I always go through the risks and benefits if we're considering medications. Um, and medications are very much something to do in addition to graded exercise. So I wouldn't normally recommend them on their own. I would say this is a great addition to exercise programs. Um, so those would be one option. Um, other things like fludrocortisone can really help with blood pressure. So that can be helpful both for POTS and orthostatic hypotension if people are struggling with that. Um, and then kind of more on the, the functional side for medication options, um, I've had some really good success with low dose naltrexone for some patients. Um, I had uh, one woman who um, had kind of post-COVID syndrome. That's another um, thing we commonly see associated with POTS, or maybe not commonly, but a good number, like 25 to 50 percent of people with post-COVID syndrome have POTS. Um, so for those folks, I've had a few that um, it was just really debilitating. They had trouble doing their day-to-day -day things. Um, one woman in particular, I mentioned she was having trouble doing yoga. That's something she really enjoyed, and she just couldn't 
couldn't kind of bend over and come up on the mat very well. She would get a lot of symptoms. Um, so we decided to try some low dose naltrexone, which is pretty minimal in terms of side effects. It's pretty well tolerated. So it's one of my favorites. Um, and she's uh, doing yoga teacher training now. She's like doing amazing. <laughs> um, so it's just like really heartwarming to see. Yeah, some of these medications can be really helpful. Anything else in the functional medicine spectrum that you wanted to mention? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are some nutrient deficiencies to be aware of and, and treat, especially if they're there. Um, so for heart rate, particularly important is magnesium. So making sure someone's getting adequate amounts of that. Um, there are a lot of different forms of magnesium, so that's something to be aware of. <laughs> um, some forms like magnesium oxide or magnesium citrate can be more um, uh, they help with bowel flow. <laughs> so if somebody's already maybe having looser stools or diarrhea, I probably wouldn't use those forms. I'd use something more like magnesium glycinate or magnesium threonate that tend not to cause that so much. Um, but if someone's struggling with constipation, the magnesium oxide or magnesium citrate can be really helpful. <laughs> so, um, so magnesium is really important to be aware of. Um, and then the other big one I think about too that's been associated with POTS is vitamin B deficiencies. So those are pretty easy to test for, pretty inexpensive. Um, and in terms of supplementation, that's also pretty easy to do. Okay, perfect. So um, I think we actually covered quite mm -hmm. a bit. We were, you know, symptoms, disorders, how to test for that, treatment options, um, a story of success, and how you're incorporating this, you know, conventional medicine with functional medicine. It's so important to get a, a you know comprehensive look at a person. Um, are there any final key kind of takeaways that you want to give people um, who might suspect that they are having dizziness related to an autonomic nervous system disorder? Yeah, definitely. I would, I would say I've, I've seen, um, when I do see some patients with this, sometimes they've been kind of disheartened. They've um, gone along a long path to healing, but I like to let people know, you know, 90% of patients with POTS do get better. They do respond really well to treatment. So if this is something um, you are struggling with, I really encourage you to reach out to your doc or um, whoever you're working with to really get things better for you. So definitely work with, you know, if you're working with physical therapy, like with your group or whoever it is, I, I think I just encourage you to, to keep at it. Um, it's definitely something that we can, we can work on healing. Okay. Are there any resources that you'd like to mention? Because I know for me, what I hear is you're lovely, but that's not what a lot of patients' experiences are. Sure. You know, I, I do have a, a couple patients who are like, I've gone through so much financially mm -hmm. and I'm not getting the answers or even my heart rate has skyrocketed to 150 in front of somebody. And they said, it's not bad enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are there any resources of trusted providers that people can look, maybe a, a directory you mentioned, um, a, a couple resources maybe for people? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so if they're looking for someone um, with functional training, the Institute for Functional Medicine is a really nice resource. They have a great practitioner directory. Um, so it's ifm.org um, for those folks. Um, and then in terms of um, maybe finding um, like a primary doc that has more time with them um, and is able to be aware of community resources that they can refer to, um, like local PT groups like yourself, or has good connections where they work really closely with other health professionals, um, direct primary care physicians are a really great option. Um, so there's the DPC mapper. Um, that's a nice thing. If you just Google DPC mapper, um, you can just put in your zip code and find someone close to you. Um, those DPC docs just tend to spend more time with patients and really um, have the time and energy to get curious about what's going on with somebody. And, and um, they tend not to be burnt out. So we tend to really enjoy um, figuring out, um, we're a little bit like Sherlock Holmes. We love to figure things out with you. So um, those are both some really good places to start. Perfect. And and just let everybody know, which I'll put in the description um, notes below, but let everybody know again who you are, where they can learn more about you and uh, which areas, states. I don't know if you're doing telehealth outside of Ohio, but um, who can work with you and how can they find you? Great. Hey, thanks, Amy. <laughs> um. Can you, can you um, really quick just run down, oh. yeah, your website? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so um, if you look at empoweredhealthdpc.com, that's my website. 
Um, and then I do offer free meet and greets for folks that are interested in finding out if it's a good fit for you. I spend a few minutes on the phone to make sure um, we're a good fit. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of um, who I treat. So I do offer um, phone and video appointments for my patients. Um, typically, I just treat patients in Ohio just because um, that's how my medical license works. Um, so kind of local area, um, but all across Ohio. I do have a few patients a little bit away that I'll do phone or video visits for. Um, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. White, for joining us on the Treat Dizziness at Home channel. And I look forward to speaking with you in the future. So everybody stay healthy, stay steady, stay strong.